Racing isn't easy, but experiencing it is. iRacing puts you in the driver's seat with the industry's leading sim racing game. Drive on laser scan replicas of the greatest racing circuits from around the world. Go head to head against other drivers chosen by skill based matchmaking to ensure competitive racing at every level. Compete across all your favorite series. In officially licensed cars, engineered to deliver the most accurate driving experience possible. Join a race or host your own with players from across the globe. Race against the computer or in a league with friends. Feel the thrill behind the wheel. Visit iRacing.com. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another week of Collegiate iRacing League action as tonight we bring you the Music in the Noise 200 from Nashville Super Speedway. It's the second round of the Flexware College Cup Series playoffs, and tonight's going to be an incredible race. But first, we're going to get started with tonight's Ignition Zone pre-race show where we're going to talk about last week's results as well as the playoffs so far to get us hyped up for this week's event as i'm your host as usual zach lindler alongside alex gagnon in the booth and alex we're going nash car racing tonight and of course i had to get in the mood with the flannel and the cowboy <laughs> hat you know we came to nashville last season it was a phenomenal race everybody had a blast out there and this was in fact one of the most highly requested tracks to come back onto the calendar this season so the drivers have been looking forward to this race all season long but for our 10 playoff drivers in the field and for our nine who have yet to lock themselves in the championship four, there's a little something extra riding on the line tonight. Yeah, there is. This is the second of three playoff races here to decide who of our 10 playoff drivers will make that championship four in two weeks time. Last week, a thrilling race at Vegas, or not Vegas, sorry, I'm thinking of other miles, most difficult track on the schedule, just as far as race ability. It's high banked, it's concrete, Tires and brakes are both not happy at this kind of track. It's going to be a really interesting challenge, but it presents a lot of similar challenges to Darlington, in my opinion, outside of the track surface. So the cars who did really well last week, I would not be surprised to see them running up front here tonight as well. Yeah, you said it best. This is an all concrete track. It's a mile and a half long. It's very high banked, even on the straightaways. Uh, this is a very, very fast track, and uh, with it being a little warm out there tonight for our drivers, uh, resource management is once again going to be the key to success, one of the keys to success here in the Flexware Cup Series, and especially for uh, whoever wins tonight's race. Uh, and if it's a playoff driver, as usual, they will lock themselves into the championship four, as we saw Ball State's Daniel Nanny do last week at Darlington, uh, having to snatch that victory from the rest of the field uh it was a really really exciting race it went green for uh, most of the laps we only had a couple cautions that came out towards the end of the race but despite all that green flag racing we had tons of battles on track from first all the way to last and but especially that battle inside the top 10 and even in the top five where a lot of those drivers were playoff drivers yeah. They know what's on the line. They're going to leave it all out there on track to try and take home the victory tonight. Yeah, they really are. I mean, 
there was a stretch of time in that Darlington race where seven, the top seven cars and eight of the top nine were all playoff drivers. They came to play last week. All of them had a run that ranged from great to pretty solid. The problem was if you were on the back end of that list, even though you got a decent bit of points, so many playoff drivers had a great week last week that you still ended up losing ground. Jason Wallet, I believe, finished 13th for Drexel. It was a pretty solid run, all things considered. He fell behind the eight ball early a little bit with some damage. Rallied back, though, for a solid finish. But he is really in a tough spot here with only two races to go in this uh, playoff round. Because so many of his competitors had such a good week last week that he ended up losing quite a bit of distance to those in the top four. So you can't afford to have two bad weeks in a row, especially if the playoff drivers are going to go out and run again this week like they did last week at Darlington because there was no room for error last week. Unless you pick up that win, that will automatically lock you into the championship four. But yeah, let's go ahead and actually let's take a look at our point standings among our playoff drivers as we head into tonight's race. There you see the one and only driver to lock himself into the championship four so far. Daniel Nanny from Ball State did so last week. Matt Morton, though, in a close second, um, as well as Ar Muhammad Alif and Clint Halterman in the points transfer positions coming into tonight's race. And but then it gets really, really tight outside of the top four. Zach DeWale and Jake Cummings tied on points. They're 21 points off of Matthew Morton. Uh, Andrew Williams there in seventh. He's only two points behind both DeWale and Cummings. Charles Wembley also there uh, in that points battle as well. But if you're Andrew Stagey from Ball State or Jason Wallet from Drexel, you've definitely got some work to do tonight as 35 points is a pretty steep hill to climb. Uh, that puts Wallet, I believe... If my math is mathing, 22 points below the cut line going into uh, Kansas in just two weeks' time. So a good result for uh, a playoff driver is always a good thing to have. But like you said, you can finish in the top 15. But if every other playoff driver finishes uh, above you, you're still going to lose ground on uh, the drivers in front of you. Yeah, for sure. And your math was indeed correct. Jason Wallet sits 22 points back of that final playoff or final championship four spot right now. And then you also look at Andrew Stege, who sits 19 points back of that spot. So they are still within range. If they have two really solid points runs to potentially have a chance to point their way in. But more realistically, I think they're going to have to win their way in. And if you're Matt Morton, you can pretty safely point your way in. But obviously, he would like a win to take away all doubt. Where things start getting really fuzzy is that middle grouping there. You see Clint Halterman, that eight-point edge over to Whale and Cummings, 10 points over Drew Williams. I mean, those are not a ton of spots on track. If you have, you know, an errant corner and lose out a couple on a restart, that gap cuts in half almost immediately. So while he has that points cushion that he can rely on a little bit, in a tiebreaker situation, he's still going to have to go out there and perform to the best of his ability because if he lets up even for a second, there is a lot of hungry drivers behind him. And you look outside that top four right now, multiple drivers outside the top four as they run have a win this season. Both Jake Cummings and Charles Wembley won in the regular season to lock themselves in. And they're not in the top four yet, but they have shown that they can win in the CIL this season. That should definitely give some of those guys in the top four a little bit of pause and a little bit of concern, knowing that there's a lot of speed still stymied behind them right now. Yeah, and this is even work that these drivers have done going back into the regular season. Uh, if you finish in the top five, if you finished in the top five of a regular season race, then you got playoff points. You got five bonus points for winning, four bonus bonus points for finishing second, all the way back to one point in fifth. At the end of the season, if you made the playoffs, that points tally of playoff points that you got during the regular season was added to your two thousand point reset at the beginning of last race. So Matthew Morton, who was sitting on a fat stack of playoff points as well as our Muhammad Alif and Clint Halterman, that's helping them out a ton going into the first race of the season. It's still helping them out now. Um, may not have had the best race relative to other playoff drivers at Darlington, but they're still sitting in those three points transfer spots. 
uh, that could be the key to getting in. We don't know who's going to win tonight. If a playoff driver gets in, then that's going to knock Clint Halterman out. But if you're Halterman, you want a non-playoff driver to win because that means somebody's going to play spoiler and take away a lock-in spot in the championship four, which could always spell a ton of fun for next week's race at, uh, where are we, Homestead? Yeah, Homestead. Yeah. One more big, challenging mile and a half before we go to Kansas, which is one big, slightly less challenging, but definitely still a mile and a half track. Uh, a lot of mile and a half action to round out the CIL season after a crazy regular season took us all over the place, all over the globe even. I mean, we had that race in Montreal, so the CIL really kind of bouncing around all over the place this year, but really digging into the bread and butter of these uh, next-gen cars here for the playoffs, letting those mile and a half do all the work. Um, but I think about this race, I think about what it's going to take to win a race here at Nashville Super Speedway. And I think the biggest thing that comes to my mind, Zach, is how do you manage your brakes over a long run? We saw in the couple of uh, next-gen races that the IRL NASCAR Cup Series has had at this track, there was a big issue with brakes and a big issue with rotors. While iRacing will not be so mean as to just randomly give you a rotor failure in the middle of the yeah. corner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> What they will do is really tax the tire wear. And on a hot track, that's just going to expedite it even further. Um, so people who are really aggressive on these restarts may gain a ton of positions early, but they might really suffer if we have a long green flag run because there's just not a good way to get those tires to cool back down once they get too hot. Yeah, the key to races like this is pace. Not speed, but pace. You know, you don't necessarily have to be the fastest one out track. You just have to be the one with the most pace when it matters towards the end of the race. So you can sacrifice two, three, four positions on a restart if it means you're going to save your tires on that initial launch uh, because the restarts are the most physically demanding parts of the race on the tires. Um, but you also need to save those tires and those brakes and maybe even that fuel if we see a fuel mileage race come into play. Uh where you're going to start to pick up speed relative to everybody else who's already burned through their tires and their brakes at that point. So those two, three, four spots that you concede at a restart may turn into six or seven later on in the event. And that's something that we've seen Matt Morton do more than a few times already this season. It's how he got up to the front at Darlington last week. It's how he's done it at um, Vegas, I think we saw, where we, we were very quick to claim that he was having problems early on in the race yeah. but very it was quickly. actually him <laughs> yeah it was actually him having uh or it wasn't him having problems it was him saving tires and about 30 40 laps later here comes that number one ohio state machine rocketing his way up through the field uh and i believe he won that race actually yeah. so he was able to win that on that strategy and so i think this is a track that's going to play very much into his strength tonight um and it, i've I believe it's almost time for picks but we do want to do a quick rundown of the points coming into tonight's race you've seen your playoff points coming in uh with your leader daniel nanny is the only one locked in at the moment uh but looking at our student individual drivers championships charles wembley is actually on top of that right now by six points over matthew morton after you factor in both of the drop weeks uh but matthew morton six points behind charles wembley jason wallet right now in third, 13 points off the lead. Andrew Stagey for Ball State, 17 points off the lead. And R. Muhammad Alif, Stagey's teammate, is only three points behind Stagey. He's 20 points off of a potential student driver's championship. Now, Ball State's having a little better luck in the school championship side on the student school championship on the student side. They're leading by 41 points over Guilford College. Uh, Drexel is in third, 50 points off of that lead. Wingate is 71 points off the lead thanks to Brandon Schulenberger and Valparaiso University a little bit of a sleeper here they have somehow worked their way into that fifth position between Ethan Decatur and uh, Ricky Paz there's 77 points off of that student championship so it's still possible there that Valpo could pull off something massive but it doesn't look like Ball State's going to be able to be touched over on the I alumni mean, side now Oop, go ahead I was going to say, when you bring the fleet that Ball State does to these oval races, you do have a really good opportunity to have uh, the most points in a given week. Uh, when you have five drivers going out there on a full-time schedule, running for points, and then having 
guys as consistently good as our Muhammad Ali and Daniel Nanny, guys like Andrew Stagey who are never not out of the conversation, and then folks like uh, you know Kelton Quick uh, who can give you the good performance here or there, uh, and uh, Lucas Moody as well. Uh, it just it really starts to add up because no one else has that level of depth, and that's how they've amassed such a heavy lead on the uh, the school championship here. Yeah, the top scoring driver for each school is the one that scores points at the end of the race for their school. So the more drivers you have, the more likely you are to finish towards the top and score some more points. You're absolutely right. But looking at the alumni side, Clint Halterman on top of that championship right now. He's got a four-point lead over fellow playoff driver Zach DeWale. And then Drew Williams, another playoff driver in third place. He's 22 points off of that lead, followed by Andrew Burrell and Nick Stockner. It's actually an orange wheel racing one, two, three, four, five in the alumni championship. That is an incredible team effort from those guys to basically lock out that title. UNC Charlotte on the school side is currently in the lead. Eight points over St. Clair College. Clemson is in third, 15 points off the lead. And then UNT, University of North Texas, in fourth, 69 points off of the lead right now. And then Wingate bringing it up in fifth, 93 points off of the lead there. So still some really good battles uh, in the individual and school side as we head into our championship race in just a couple of weeks. But Alex, I'm watching that countdown at the bottom of the screen come down ever so slowly as we inch closer to race time. And I think that means it's time for our picks. And as usual, I'm going to let you go first. Alrighty. Well, I feel like you should be aware of the fact that while you were out last week, I was correct again in my oh, prediction. Oh, I don't like this. <laughs> so I am rolling two for two over the past couple of weeks, which means I'm going to try and give the uh, the hot hand here to the 519 of Zach DeWale from St. Clair College. He's been running really well the past couple of weeks. Um, and we'll see if we can go three in a row here because I have had a the eyes of an eagle when it comes to finding the winner the past couple of weeks. Well, I'm hoping to put a stop to that momentum because I'd like to get back in the W column. And I think Drew Williams from Clemson University is going to help me out. He came third here. Uh, when we came to this track for the first time last season, got on the podium, uh, lost out to, I believe, race winner Drew Jawa and Matt Morton. Uh, but I think Williams, he's been putting in a ton of work to get ready for this race. I think he's got that fire lit in his belly that he wants that win uh, because he knows his path to the championship four isn't necessarily paved for him, and he's going to have to work for it. So look for Williams to get the job done tonight. And it's well, going to be. We'll just have to see how this uh, plays out. A couple playoff drivers, both in desperate need of a good points finish or a win tonight. Yeah, and will a playoff driver win, or is somebody going to play spoiler? We're going to take a quick break, head on down to Honky Tonk Highway, downtown Nashville, and uh, go. We're going to take a quick break, and we will be right back in just a few minutes with our race action tonight.
daily bread. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another week of Collegiate iRacing League action. As tonight, we welcome you to the Melody in the Noise 200, presented by the Familiar Strange, live from the virtual Nashville Super Speedway. That's right, it's Nash Car Night in the Flexware College Cup Series, as our drivers will turn up the music and jam out with each other for 133 laps of intense playoff racing on these concrete high banks. We're deep into playoff season in the Flexware Cup Series as tonight's event is round two of the playoffs. Last week, Daniel Nanny from Ball State University earned a hard-fought victory at Darlington and became the first driver to lock himself into the championship four at Kansas. There's two more opportunities that await the rest of our playoff drivers to follow in Nanny's steps and take one more step themselves towards eternal CIL glory but they'll have to do-si-do -do their way through the field to try and score spot number two. That's right, we're on the threshold of championship season with the title race in two weeks, but first, we gotta take a quick trip down Honky Tonk Highway for a grand old race. Welcome everybody to the Melody in the Noise 200 presented by The Familiar Strange. As I'm your host this evening, Zach Lindler, alongside Alex Gagnon in the booth. And Alex, we talked about this in the Ignition Zone pre-race show, but Nashville put on one heck of a show last time in its debut, and I'm expecting this will be an extremely entertaining race as well. Yeah, I think it will be. You know, this is, much like Darlington, one of those tracks where the moment you start driving it, you know it's like not like any other track you've driven previously. It's high banked, it's concrete, it gives the atmosphere of Dover. If you stretch it out, they start hitting the speeds that you would at a Darlington or a Kansas. You know, it's a high speed track that's tough on tires, it's tough on brakes. Uh, it's gonna be tough on the drivers mentally too. 133 laps around this place is no small feat. It's gonna be a pretty hardy race tonight and only the best are gonna make their way to the front. And we've got nine playoff drivers who have not locked themselves into the championship four just yet you know they'd want more than anything to punch their ticket here tonight uh, but it's going to be far from easy and they're also going to probably need a little bit of luck i mean this race is all said and done it is very unlikely that you find yourself winning this thing without a little bit of help and as you see it like as you mentioned alex mile and a half concrete track this uh very unique d oval shape uh very highly very steeply banked in the corners and even on the front and back straightaways uh the pit road at this track is actually relatively easy to get on uh the straightforward banking coming out of turn four makes it really easy to get the car slowed down and onto pit road but mistakes are still possible and they can still ruin a race especially when you're in the playoffs Looking for a bid at the championship four spot where losing just a couple positions on track can mean the difference uh, between you making it in and sitting out pretty much at Kansas. Uh, but there you see 1.3 miles. We'll call this a mile and a half track because it fits uh, six degrees of banking on the straightaways. I on the back stretch, I believe it's nine on the front stretch and 14 in the corners, that 45 mile an hour pit road speed. And these cars are going to be coming down from about 150 on corner exit to 45 in just a few hundred feet. And as we mentioned, this circuit first on the NASCAR calendar last season, uh, first on the Flexware Cup Series calendar last fall, and the drivers absolutely loved it. They were begging for another Nashville race this season. Well, the <laughs> the scheduling gods have giveth, and we have Nashville Nash car racing once again, and everybody's been excited. But it just means a little bit more this time around because there's championship four positions on the line for our playoff drivers. Yeah, and there's a couple of drivers who I think their driving style 
will be really well suited to a track like this. You see, once again, our vehicles here tonight, these heavy 670 horsepower V8 engines are going to be rolling around here, as much as you pointed out, probably up to about 170-ish miles an hour going in the corner entry. And then they're going to have to get it slowed way down through those corners. This concrete oval, very unforgiving in that sense. But I think the cars who have the ability to make tires last, who have good long run speed, will be the cars you see up front there tonight. So I'm thinking, guys, maybe like a Matt Morton, maybe like a uh, R. Muhammad Ali, maybe like a Zach DeWale. Guys who can make those tires last a long time will find their way to the front sooner rather than later. But if we get into the situation of cautions, breeding cautions toward the end of the race, you never know what you might see. Uh, Nashville has that little bit of uncharacteristic uh, energy that surrounds it at any given point in time. And uh, I think we'll see a couple of those instances out here tonight. Although the question is really going to be who will the misfortune befall upon? Yeah, there's really two keys to winning tonight's race. Number one is pace. And number two is minimizing mistakes. We talked about this in the Ignition Zone show where you don't necessarily have to be the fastest person out there on track at any given point. You just have to be the one that's managing their resources the best. Like you like you said, this tire is going to chew this. Excuse me. This track is going to chew up your tires and spit them back out at you. <laughs> what if I would love to see a tire on? chew up a track and spit it back out, but I don't think that's possible. <laughs> I'm going to need a really hard tire for that to happen. <laughs> yeah, but managing your resources is going to be critical to finding victory lane tonight, as well as minimizing mistakes. You know, we talked about mistakes on pit road. We've seen that bite a few of our drivers already this season and cost them dearly as a result. Uh, but even mistakes out on track, you know, if you lose the car a little bit going into the corner, coming out of the corner, maybe you've overheated your tires as well. That's going to be a big mistake that's going to wind up costing you in the long run because these tires don't cool down very easily either. Uh, so those two things in combination, I think, is how we're going to see somebody get to victory lane tonight. Is it going to be a playoff driver or is it going to be somebody who's on the outside looking in that's looking to play spoiler? We got 133 laps to figure that out. Yeah, and uh, you know, drivers are just starting to wrap up qualifying here, which means in a couple of minutes we will have the opening grid for tonight's uh, Melody in the Noise 200. Let's take a look here while we've got a second at what a qualifying lap and just a lap around Nashville Super Speedway as a whole looks like. It sounds like we have the onboard lap with the 100 of Jake Cummings to give us the tour of Nashville Super Speedway from the on-track perspective. We're going to watch that with number 100 car, the defending alumni champion possibly at risk of losing his title. He's going to give it his all tonight to try and work his way back up the field. But you see him running that very bottom line, very slow and lumbersome through turns one and two. This track is deceptively slow. You want to run a lot, uh, a lot slower in the corners than you think you do because it's so easy to overdrive the car. So good work from him. Uh, keeping that car low, keeping that momentum up, washing all the way out to the exit. You can see how steep the front stretch is here at Nashville. Take it all the way to the bottom to finish your lap. And as we ride on board, you're going to see him do it expertly once again. Yeah, so getting all the way down to that yellow line through one and two. Nice soft drive up to the outside. Much to your point, you want to be really careful. The worst thing you can do at Nashville is overdrive the car. And while you might be able to get that extra 10th or two on qualifying here consistently over a green flag run, you're just going to absolutely kill the tires as he makes his way off of four and then we will dive down uh, to the start finish line. And we'll see a lot of that, I think, tonight, uh, even side by side. You know, cars will come off the corner all the way to the outside wall and then they'll find their way back down low to the start finish line. It's the straightest way across the front stretch, uh, the shortest amount of time, shortest amount of distance. Therefore, in a lot of cases, the fastest way to go. Uh, but when you start going side by side through that section, it gets a little trickier. A um, lot less grip and a lot less downforce when you have that side draft in effect. And we, we might see a couple cars get into a little bit of trouble there. Yeah, and that's, uh, <clears throat> that's going to be a really fun... Uh, that's what makes a lot of these mile-and-a-half tracks really fun. This special D-oval configuration, that curved front stretch 
you see a lot of battles for position down the front stretch. You're going to see guys go side by side coming out of turn four, and they may not be side by side going into turn one. Somebody's going to have the shorter distance going down the front stretch, but somebody's going to have the longer way to go around. But that means they're going to have more momentum and speed coming into turn one. So it all pretty much balances out at the end, but it makes racing a little trickier here. So those either eye racing or real life spotters are going to be pretty busy uh, down the front stretch here in Nashville. Now let's take a look at tonight's starting grid for the Melody and the Noise 200 for the CIL Flexware College Cup Series from Nashville. It's Daniel Nanny from Ball State, last week's winner, and Matt Morton from Ohio State on the outside. He finished second here last season. Andrew Stagey for Ball State puts in a granted for the first non-playoff driver in the field there. He'll roll off fourth. Jake Cummings, his teammate, will roll off fifth for Wingate. Or Muhammad Ali from Ball State in sixth. In row seven, it's Zach DeWale from St. Clair College in the 519. And Jason Wallet in the 76 from Drexel, a pair of playoff drivers in seventh and eighth. And in row five, it's Charles Wimbley from Guilford College and Ben Neller from Ball State. Looking at our second ten, group of 10 drivers, Clint Halterman will start to the inside of Sky Shrek from University of Oklahoma. That is, I believe, uh, one of her best qualifying efforts thus far this season. Thomas Toomey will start to the outside of his teammate Drew Williams from Clemson University. Row number eight, Austin DeLong from the Penn College of Technology starts outside of Lucas Moody from Ball State University. Row 9, Landon Veliki, Auburn University. That Tiger will start to the outside of another Ball State Cardinal in Kelton Quick in that number 2 car. And rounding out our top 20 tonight, Zach Tallman from the Pennsylvania College of Technology will start alongside Edwin Onofre from the University of North Texas. Back in 21st, it'll be Edward Sanchez from Baruch College and Andrew Burrell from Clemson in the 121 will be 22nd. And that is the starting grid for tonight's race. 22 cars ready to take on this 1.3 mile track here in Nashville. Daniel Nanny and Matt Morton, the top two cars in the playoff standings right now. Nanny locked himself in with a win last week. Matt Morton will likely be in on points, but he's looking to try and get a victory to lock himself in alongside that 30. So many questions to be answered. So little time here as the pace car is about to peel off in turn four. Yeah, Fred, the pace car driver, makes the trip down pit road. It's Daniel Nanny, the control car. Who's going to be the next playoff driver to lock themselves in? Or who is going to be the non-playoff driver to play? Spoiler tonight, green flag in the air at Nashville. Looked for a second like the front five or the front ten. We're going to try to play nice there on lap one. But just as quickly as we went single file, we are back to side by side. That's, uh, I believe, Jake Cummings taking away that third position from Andrew Stagey. But it's still a hornet's nest behind them as they come down the backstretch for the second time. All these battles inside the top ten already. These drivers have are leaving it all on the line already. They know what's at stake. They're pushing for every position they can to try and put just another playoff driver behind them because that means they are that much closer to the win as now both of those Wingate drivers and Cummings and Schulenberger are going to go side by side. Those two Bulldog cars are going to try to work together here for a little bit to try and subdue the Great Wall of Ball slowly forming behind them in Andrew Stege and Ar Muhammad Alif, who goes to the inside. Stege with a move on Schulenberger. Shoved that car to the inside. He's alongside Schulenberger and will stay there out of the corner. What a move from that 88 car. Yeah, aggressive moves early. You know, the old adage... 
is that you can't win a race on lap three, but you could certainly lose it. Nearly happened to both the 7 and the 88 there as Stagey dove to the inside with not a whole lot of room to operate. He was able to keep that car together and in one piece. Now starting to fall back just a little bit from the 7 as it looks like his teammate, Ar Muhammad Alif, going to roll that outside lane, try and take away that fifth position. And just Ooh, behind Zach them, DeWale. Mason Wallet and Z uh, Zach DeWale side-by-side -side action. Here goes Wallet on the outside. Looks like the outside lane off of turn four seems to have that little bit more momentum in the early going. Well, that's how that's going to work in the early stages of this race. When you have newer tires, that outside line is going to be really, really quick. It's the faster way around the track. It's going to be a little bit nicer on the tires. But as these tires wear in and get heat in them, you're going to see a lot of these drivers run towards the bottom of the track. Instead, they're going to take that shorter way around to be able to have that fire off out of the corner uh, to make a run on the driver in front of them. But it looks like it's settled out, settled out now for the time being. Our Muhammad Alif settling into that last spot in the top five. He's going to maybe have a stab at the seven of Schulenberger in a couple laps here. But there's battles behind them that are heating up. I see the 88 and the 519 still side by side. That's another playoff battle. And Charles Wembley now knocking on the door of the top 10. He's worked his way into the ninth position. But right now, Schulenberger in fourth and Ben Neller in that 10th position are the only non-playoff drivers in the top 10. Yeah, a lot of playoff drivers all battling for position, including our leaders right now. Matt Morton on the back bumper of Daniel Nanny. If we can take a look here at this uh, scrap for the lead. Morton about a car length away from Nanny. He gets a little bit closer in the corners and then the 30 able to open it up just a little bit. You see them make their way in the turn number one. That gap remains one car length between the two. The 30 has led all seven laps to this point. Matt Morton's been in his tire tracks every step of the way though. Not gaining or losing any ground right now, just kind of lurking in the wings as this is the early going and things are still kind of getting settled out on track. Well, and if you're Matt Morton right now, you're not pushing the you're not pushing or anything. You're perfectly fine sitting behind Nanny. You're learning where he goes. You're learning what he does, why he does it. This is a, this is a study your opponent uh, straight out of the art of war or something that Morton's going to do right here because this is going to probably come back later in this race when these two are battling for the race win. Morton's going to have the upper advantage of knowing what Nanny does uh, while he's out in front with clean air. But uh, on that topic of clean air, dirty air, not really a problem right now. These tires still relatively fresh. Uh, we're going to see those lap times start to come down at about two or three laps or so. So the dirty air might become a disadvantage to Morton, but it looks like for the time being, he's hanging just about a tenth or two off of that back bumper of the 30 ball state car. Yeah, he keeps getting anywhere from about 15 hundredth back to a quarter of a second. He's just been fluctuating in that range right now as this is starting to get all settled in. You see on board there, that is the number one of Matt Morton. Uh, really locked in here in the early go, and I don't even think he's blinked yet. That's how locked in he is right now, trying to track down the back bumper of the 30. So as this that. is now lap 11 of 133, it is the 30 and the 1 who have opened up a gap for a little bit from the rest of the field, and these two cars continue to be uh, just running nose to tail right now. Jake Cummings hanging within a second here in that third spot after gaining two on the opening restart. And now he's settled in in front of teammate Brennan Schulenberger as those uh, Wingate cars having a really solid run here in the early going. You know, I was thinking when we were taught, when we were running off the starting grid, Brandon Schulenberger had a phenomenal qualifying spot. That's a car that's picked up a ton of momentum this season. Something has clicked for the driver of that number seven car, and he's showing a ton of pace all of a sudden uh but i'm thinking all the way back to um oh what was it that he first he had he had a breakout um oh gosh i can't think of it but it was about halfway through the season uh when he got his first string first of his string of really good finishes and he's kept that momentum all the way until now so hopefully he'll be able to ride that high to the end of the season even though he just barely missed out on the playoffs i think there's still big things coming for this for this number 17. Yeah, that is. I mean, he has been running really well. He qualified really well last week as well. He was the first non-playoff driver to qualify at Darlington. 
and this week here at National Super Speedway. So that number seven showing a lot of pace and a lot of a lot of hunger here for that victory, even though he may not be fighting for a championship. His teammate, though, and Jake Cummings is, and I have no doubt that the two of them are going to try and work together a little bit to help each other achieve that uh, the goals of one another, to help that 100 and his championship hunt and to help that seven get his first CIL victory. And I think both of these drivers are really, really good at working with each other. We've heard them shout each other out in interviews after races, but Cummings and Schulenberg are two really good teammates. They know that they're in it together, that uh, they're only going to do well when they work together. It's easier to have two versus the field than just by yourself. Uh, but I know, I know that Schulenberger, as much as he wants that first win, I think the priority right now is going to be to get Jake Cummings into that championship four. Uh, but if, if you're Schulenberger and if I know him, I think he's going to try and take a stab at that win any chance he could get. As right now, he's having to go on the defensive against Ar Muhammad Alif in that Ball State car. He's gained a, about a couple tenths on the back bumper of that number seven machine over the past few laps. So Alif is coming. Uh, it's just a matter of when I think he gets around this number seven to take his shot at the lead. Yeah, so 16 laps uh, complete here from Nashville. You're looking through this top 10, and everything is kind of settled in here for the early going once that scramble on the restart ensued. Now everyone's starting to try and run their line, trying to make sure they have tires to save. And we'll start to see some of these cars either move up and down the timing table, depending on how well they were able to keep their stuff together. We look a little farther back in the field here. Drew Williams, who needed to uh, do some digging here to get up into that front pack. He didn't have a great qualifying effort. That 123 is going to get around the 13 of Lucas Moody. Uh, maybe he had the nose ahead last lap, but he might actually lose out here through one and two. That is the onboard battle with both of those drivers. Williams on your left, Moody on your right. As they battle it out for the 12th position here, Moody on the inside has a full car length ahead, and now Williams will dive in behind the 13, maybe looking to do a bit of a crossover move here off a of four. And there it is. Now it's Williams to the inside of Moody across the stripe. They're nose to tail. Williams inside of Moody. They're going to be side by side going into the corner. Williams is trying to break into the top 10 for the first time tonight. He had a really poor qualifying. Uh, and now, now he's really trying to get some momentum on his side and uh, getting around Moody, obviously, is step number one. But his teammate, Thomas Toomey, broke into the top 10 for about a half a lap there over Ben Neller. Those two were fighting tooth and nail for that position. But it looks like Toomey has conceded that position for the time being as both of these drivers still side by side after a couple laps. This is the kind of racing that these drivers love here in Nashville. This constant side by side, the battle that won't stop. It's so hard to pass here, but when you finally get that pass made, it feels so good to finally have that done. And to that point, it's also a lot of side by side action, not because they're necessarily glued to each other, but each car in a different lane has different parts of the track where they tend to run best. You know, you get those good runs off the corner on the high side, but that shorter distance uh, through the front stretch on the low side helps you get some of that momentum back. And it creates a bit of an accordion effect where you're kind of, you know, seesawing back and forth on who's got the advantage at any given point. So it does create some very dynamic battling when you're side by side as Williams will settle into 13th for now. But he's got a mirror full of another Ball State driver there in Kelton Quick just behind him. Producer Christian, if we could go back to that onboard camera of Williams, I want to point out something that he's doing uh, real quick, real subtle. But Williams is actually shifting in the corners. So watch, watch his fingers on those paddle shifters as he goes into the corner. Maybe not that time by, but you're going you're gonna to see him on this front straightaway. That's his upshift that he's got in his hand. Right there. There it was. So Williams is going down into fourth to get into the corner using that torque and that higher RPM to get the launch off. And then he's shifting up to fifth down the straightaway for the top end speed. Now that's gonna give you that's gonna give you a pretty decent advantage uh, coming out of the corner where you're in the higher RPMs, you're gonna be able to put more horsepower down. 
but that's also going to burn through your tires just a little bit quicker than everybody else. Uh, as we see now, they've, this little group has caught up to Jason Wallet. This is now a three-way battle to take away that 11th position. Uh, so Williams electing to shift. I wonder if there's any other drivers out there uh, doing that. And you can you can hear it as he goes through the corner and right there on the back stretch. And he'll uh, he'll be shifting around this track. And if he's going to be doing it this early into the run, you know, by the end of the day, he'll have shifted that car up and down quite a bit. Uh, and it helps him to good effect there, get around the 76 of Jason Wallet. And as he rolls on by, he will now be scored in 12th position. He's got a mirror full of Clint Halterman and Jason Wallet, though. A couple of these playoff drivers all knows the tale. I think someone <laughs> needs to give the 077 a spin. It might look a little upside down there on the car. I just looks noticed like the, that. Uh, it looks like the entire paint scheme's <laughs> actually been flipped. So a little April Fool's fun there for the 077 of Clint Halterman. Let's take a look at that bad boy for a lap, and it's now facing the... That would honestly, I think, freak me out if I had the face of that was on my car staring back at me for 133 <laughs> laps. I would find that a bit unsettling. Uh, the numbers, Norm's upside down, that Charlotte's upside down. You know, I think if, if, he, if he winds up ballparking that car and going over, it's going to be really funny. Whoa, Whoa, big slide for the two. Big moment. Kelton quick Big in moment. the grass. And he saves it and keeps going. Good hands from Kelton quick in that number two car to keep that machine going. Yeah. We'll have to take a look at the replay here to see what happened to Kelton quick. We were so enamored by upside down norm. So Kelton quick in the, the fifth car in line here out of six. And it looks like maybe uh, Toomey just a little slow off the corner exit there. And Kelton Quick running out of room, tried to get down below the 166 and then just got loose and put it in the grass. And I think now we're starting to see some of that tire fade come into play. When those tires get old, when they get worn, when they get hot, you can't put the power down out of the corners like you think you can. Uh, and that results in some uh, little control issues coming out of the corner. But uh, like we said, good hands from, uh, from Quick to keep that car straightened out. I think that battle for the lead starting to heat up again as well. So is this battle here, just on back. But looked like a second ago, Matt Morton got to within a uh, contact range of the 30. He was down below a tenth of a second. As we go on board here with the one of Matt Morton, you can see that gap has not changed a ton, but he got a really good run off the corner last lap. And now we're starting to close in once again a little bit as we make our way on to lap 30 here. Daniel Nanny has led all 30 of the opening laps, but Matt Morton has not let him get away in the slightest. He has been glued to the back bumper of that Cardinal machine ever since the drop of the green flag, and now he might have a run here going into turn three. Matt Morton all over the back bumper of Daniel Nanny. This is the first real challenge for the lead we've seen all night. Morton, a little better rotation through the center of the corner. Can he get underneath the 30 down the back stretch? No, or the front stretch? No, the 30 blocks forces Morton onto the apron, and they're going to be side-by-side side into turn one. Dare I say your two main title contenders scrapping right now for the lead at Nashville. Matt Morton's and now here's got the, the lead back. for now, but here comes Daniel Nanny back to the inside. Side-by-side, side, they go through turns three and four. Ohio State on the outside. Ball State on the inside. Nanny's led the opening 30 laps. This time, though, Matt Morton closes the door on the 30. New leader here from Nashville. Nanny will try and run a half lane up from Morton here in one and two and try and pull that gap back together. But the Buckeyes machine is now up front with clean air on the nose of that car, and it might be an opportunity for him to set sail. Yeah, with the pace that Morton's been showing in the dirty air, keeping it right on the back bumper of Nanny for pretty much that whole run, clean air is going to do wonders for that number one car, and I think we're going to see him pull away relatively quickly. But if you're Nanny, it's quite the opposite. You've had clean air this entire time. You've learned how to race this track uh, at race pace in clean air, and now you've got dirty air. So how does that change how you drive the car? And in fact, a little bit of contact with the wall for Nanny, coming out of turn two so already we're seeing that dirty air throw a wrench 
in those Ball State plans. Yeah, and he started to open up that gap a little bit now. So looks like Matt Morton has set sail uh, here at the back end of this opening run in this race. Looks like there's a little bit of battling, though, just further on back. Our Muhammad Alif and Brandon Schulenberger battling it out with Jake Cummings for third. Schulenberger right on the back bumper of the 12 here. And this is the battle for third, fourth, and fifth. A Ball State Cardinal and a couple of Wingate Bulldogs going at it here. Said it was a matter of when, not if, Alif got around that number seven car. And it looks like he's got that job done. But Schulenberger not going to go gentle into that good night. He is all over the back bumper of that number 12 machine. Uh, as Alif is now setting his sights on the top three to try and get around Jake Cummings in that 100 machine. And now Schulenberger looking to the inside here in three. Had a nose to the corner panel for just a second. But Alif able to reopen that gap through the middle of the corner. Schulenberger go not going away on that inside. He is pulled up alongside the 12 of our Muhammad Alif. And they'll be side by side through the corner. It is Schulenberger down low trying to run that apron. And you've got Alif up high. A little bit of a wiggle off of turn two. But he's able to keep the hammer down. And he'll hold on the fourth for now. Some good battling going on there. Some good battling also going on just behind them. Zach DeWale and Andrew Stagey mixing it up for six. But right now, there is some real good action going on for fourth. Schulenberger leaning on a leaf a little bit off of turn four as they make their way through in the turn one on lap 37. I was going to say, both of these battles have been going on really since the start of the green flag. Uh, Schulenberger and a leaf have been going at it. Uh, Stagy and DeWale have been going at it as well. So these battles not coming to a close and no driver having any, ha having any one advantage over the other at the time being. It's making for some great racing as you see these two still nose to tail coming out of turn four. I'm impressed with this battling that they're doing, how they've managed to close the gap uh, up to Cummings ahead just a little bit. But there you see our Muhammad Alif to your bottom left and that's Jake Cummings to your bottom right riding on board with both of those drivers at the moment. And that gap continues to come down from the nose of the 12 to the back bumper of the 100. Yeah, and you can see this, the focus both of these guys have. We're getting deep into this run at this point where at the, it's whatever you saved on the car is the only thing you've got left to work with. I mean, these tires are certainly not happy with how they are being handled right now. This is a very hot racetrack. And they will go away in a hurry if you're not careful. So this battle for third really has kind of hit a stalemate where as cl close as they're running to each other, everyone's kind of reached that point in their tires where unless someone really messes something up, they might be kind of locked in there because it is really hard to try and dive in and make a pass on somebody while having the grip to try and maintain it because most of these cars do not. At least it doesn't seem like they do at this point. And now Alif has caught up to the number 100 car. Brandon Schulenberger trying to do everything he can to throw a wrench in Alif's plans. But it looks like Alif's got momentum on his side. Like you said, the only thing you have to work with now is what you've saved so far. And it looks like Alif might have saved a little bit better, but a mistake possibly for the 12 and the 7. If they didn't get in the wall, I don't think you could have put a piece of paper between the car and that blue outside wall. Uh, but now Cummings gets a better launch into turns one and two. But the advantage bar is going to go to a Leaf and Schulenberger as they come out of the corner. And those three cars now equally spaced down the backstretch as this is now a three-car battle for the third position. Yeah, Leaf tried taking a bit of an earlier entrance into turn three. And I think Schulenberger was going to try and stick it in real deep that time. And they almost made contact. The 100, though, did not get a good launch off of four. Here goes a leaf around the outside. Brandon Schulenberger might be going with him. It also almost oh, was three, about wide three wide for a second there. But now a leaf will take away that third position. And a couple of Wingate cars will scrap it out for fourth. You can yeah, see I don't think that's that they've uh, inverted those paint schemes pretty clearly there when they run side by side. And the caution oh, is out, out on lap 42. Oh, it's Drew oh. Williams in the wall. Playoff, massive playoff implications for that number 123 car. Significant damage to the front of that machine. And that might be a disastrous end. 
to tonight's race for Drew Williams. I mean, there looks to be heavy damage to that car is now. He's kind of processing the damage here. That I mean, the front end of that car just looks absolutely destroyed. And if he had to get that thing towed back to pit road, that could put him in a serious situation here. This first 42 laps had gone green the whole way. And basically everyone was still on the lead lap. So he's going to lose a lot of ground to these playoff drivers if he's stuck on pit road for a prolonged period of time. And that is if they can even repair that damage. Yeah, no fast repairs here in the Flexware College Cup Series. So if you wreck your car, that damage is going to have to get fixed. That's going to have to, you're going to have to come down pit road. Just like everybody else, the leaders are coming down pit road as expected. All going to put Williams a lap down officially. Everybody getting into their pit stall relatively clean for the time being. Daniel Nanny has that front pit stall. A little mistake maybe from Stagey is he had to bump it up just a little bit to get into his pit stall. Who's going to be the first one off of pit road? The, it's four tires all the way around for everybody. Morton's down, and he's going to take the jump and win the race off of pit road. It's a lead oh, behind him. It's a, in a dead heat between Stagey and Schulenberger. And then Nanny Charles Wimbley and I believe uh, Jake Cumming, or excuse me, uh, Clint Halterman and Zach DeWale. The 30 of Daniel Nanny lost basically the entire field on pit road there. He wasn't off until about the 16th, 17th car. I think he's going to be scored P16, uh, which is one of the last cars coming off of pit road. So I'm not sure what. Maybe he got a, a speeding penalty or something and had to serve a 30-second hold. He wasn't on for 30 seconds, though. He was only there for about an extra 10, but that was enough to lose everything. And we're getting reports from down on pit road. Uh, involuntary wheel failure, the issue there for the 123. Uh, that uh, wheel column shut off coming off of turn two and just piled it into backstretch wall. So definitely a freak situation there for the 123 but the implications there are still very real yeah, it's very rare that you see this uh we'll chalk that down to a mechanical failure uh here but there you see the 123 going through and yeah oh, something man. broke and that car went straight into the wall and that might I do be love that we had his mirrored reaction, just the uh, the oops as <laughs> that car <laughs> piled into the wall there. Not like feels this. very April Fools of his him and his uh, the steering wheel. You yeah, picked the fine time to leave me, steering wheel. <laughs> Man, tough tough situation there for the one twenty three. He was pretty close in the hunt when it came to playoff points coming into today. Uh, this is going to put him in a massive hole, and I think it might turn next week's Homestead race into a must-win situation for that Clemson driver. Yeah, he was already Looking... below the cut line. Uh, t only 10 points below the uh, P4 cutoff to make it into the championship four on points, but that's going to deal a pretty significant blow to his championship four and title hopes. Uh, and that I believe that puts my pick out of the race. So, Alex, it's in your hands now, although I don't think your, uh, your pick is having any better luck out there. Well, he's at least on track, although I do not see him That's in that true. top six grouping, so he does have some work to do to try and make his way to the front of the field, but currently scored P7 is Zach DeWale, but while well, we've got a second... The current running order, now that everyone has come down pit road, Matt Morton and R. Muhammad Alif is row one. Andrew Stagey and Brandon Schulenberger row two. And then it's Charles Wimbley and Clint Halterman there in row three. I think uh, Jake Cummings overshot his pit box a little bit and it cost him some time on pit road. Uh, so multiple cars with issues on pit road that time around between him and Nanny. And that'll really shake up this top six. And it brings our Muhammad Alif now to the front of the field to try and challenge Matt Morton for the lead here on this restart. And both of those drivers have shown great pace so far this event. Uh, but the mistakes, like we said at the top of the show, the mistakes are going to be what gets you. But still a lot of racing left in tonight's event. Matthew Morton, the winner off pit road in the control car, is going to hit the gas in the restart zone. And the green flag is back out at Nashville.
The 077 had a lot of issues firing off. I think he missed a shift. Three wide there and one and two. Contact between Cummings and Halterman. The 077 lost a ton of ground than Jake Cummings did in the process by being right behind him. They were sixth and eighth, respectively, and now they've tumbled out of the top ten. Right there in the mix with Thomas Toomey as well. This is going to be a classic CIL alumni scrap right here. All of those cars battling for position in the alumni championship as here come a couple of Ball State cars with a huge head of steam down the front stretch. That's the number two of Kelton Quick dragging along the 30 of Daniel Nanny. Sky Shrek also there in the mix. Uh, a couple mistakes early on in the race, but it looks like she's been able to recover for herself. Uh, as uh, Good Lord, that great wall of ball is moving up top. <laughs> yeah, speaking of moving up top, Sky Shrek now to the outside of Thomas Toomey. The Oklahoma machine trying to take it away on the high side and will. Good pass there for the 43, jumping ahead of the 166. And now Nanny and the 43 of Sky Shrek will do battle just ahead of Toomey here. Kelton Quick has some uh, pressure from the outside as well. Three-car battle here just outside the top 10. Daniel Nanny has got race-leading pace if he can find his way through the traffic here. Same deal with uh, Halterman. We know he's got some good pace. Same with Jake Cummings. A lot of cars with a lot of speed early on going to have some work to do to find their way up front. Looking back out up front, though, Matt Morton has retained the lead since that restart. The Leaf up into that second place. Charles Wimbley in third. He started towards the back half of the top ten and has now worked his way into that podium position. He had a great pit stop and an even better restart as he's now doing battle with the number seven of Schulenberger, who's carrying the standard for that uh, Wingate program right now. And Jake Cummings falling back to eighth. Zach DeWale, fifth. Andrew Stagey, sixth. Lucas Moody in seventh, his teammate. Jake Cummings, like we said, in eighth. Jason Wallet and Clint Halterman now round out the top ten. Just a couple laps after this most recent restart. Now, one of the things I think is really interesting is the last time we raced on concrete here in the Flexware College Cup Series was a few weeks ago at Bristol. Only a half-mile track, but the winner of that race was the 37 of Charles Wimbley. And as this race has progressed, the 37 is slowly working his way toward the front of the field. I wonder if he has anything for the leaders here, if he gets around the 7 of Schulenberger. We know how he can run on the concrete and do well. You know, this is a different situation than Bristol. Slower banking and much bigger. But the track surface remains, and the way to save tire here isn't all that different. So I'm very curious to see if the 37 would pose any challenge to the 1 or the 12 should he find his way into that top 3 spot. But, I mean, you look just behind all of this. I mean, there are cars shuffling all over the place in the back part of the top 10 here. Stagey, Cummings, Moody, Wallet. Quick and Halterman all duking it out here in the back half of the top 10. And they are just trading these positions like Pokemon cards right now. Here's a new Alexism I'm putting on a t-shirt. <laughs> trading positions like Pokemon cards. Oh, I haven't played with, I haven't played Pokemon in forever, man. Well, all I'll say is, uh, for me, it's been far more recent than forever. I'll tell you that much. But I respect that a lot. That would be that'd be pretty cool. Producer whoa. Christian now has whoa, whoa big moment out of turn four, and it looked like the thirteen of Lucas Moody, both of them heavy into the outside wall. And if I had to hazard a guess, I would say the 13 was just going to follow the 100 through that corner. The 100 overshot it a little bit, and the 13 went right off the cliff with him. Yep, both of those drivers got a big chunk of the wall coming out of turn four. That's really been kind of the boogeyman that we've seen so far tonight. A lot of drivers struggling with keeping the car out of the wall in turn four. Um, whether that's due to dirty air or tire fall off or <laughs> maybe some combination of the two will remain a mystery. But yeah, the 100 and the 13 running into some problems there coming out of turn four. And it looks like it might have impacted the 13 a little bit harsher because uh, he's lost a decent amount of pace. He's lost a couple of positions in the last lap and a half or so. Yeah, he's starting to fall back. And, you know, you got a lot of ball state cars here, 9, 10, 11, all kind of clumped together. You got a leaf there in second as well. So they're all 
kind of spread out as far as where they're at on track, but they're all balled together in this little section, all fighting for points in that top group. Clint Halterman trying to rally his way back up into the mix as well. You know, things are starting to file out here, single file in the front eight, nine cars or so. Now that the restart has kind of settled in, people know where they're at on track and how to file into that rhythm. And once again, you get into the game of how much tires have I saved while battling through the restart and how much more can I do to extend this run as long as possible. That caution came out at a really convenient time for a lot of cars who needed both fuel and fresh tires. But you can't always bank on those cautions being nice and evenly spaced that far apart. And now you really have to go to work and see what kind of long run pace your car has. Well, and there's still at least one more pit stop to be had until the end of this race. These the, the fuel tank in this car can make it about 70 laps, and the tires just maybe a couple laps more than that. So uh, if it went completely through green flag, uh, we would have seen a lot of drivers come down pit road probably in the next 10 laps or so. But that was an, a very, very well-timed caution, actually, around lap 45 that let these drivers come down and... Uh, figure out how those tires ran in that first stint, get some information, get some numbers, figure out what maybe they can do a little bit different based off of the temperature and wear readings they're getting back from their pit crews and adjust accordingly. But um, we're still going to have at least one pit stop to come about lap 100, lap 105-ish, I think is when a lot of these drivers are going to try and uh, make their second stop down pit road. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as things are settling in, I wonder if, uh, Zach, do you think we could get a word potentially uh, with the 123? It seems like his day might be over. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, talk to Drew Williams out of the car. Drew, a uh, little mechanical issue for you there, uh, about 20 laps or so. Take us through what happened. Yeah, so just going into the corner, car felt fine, and my wheelbase just literally turned off. Um, just, you know, lost lost everything. Car just went straight into the corner. Got uh, about 20 minutes of damage, so I don't think we're going to go back out. Yeah, it's a really tough situation, especially because that, uh, I mean, obviously with only this race and then one more week here in the playoffs, all those points are going to be critical. Um, I guess this means it'll be a must-win situation for you at Homestead. What'll be the, the prep going into that? I mean, I thankfully, I uh, put in a lot of prep for the Final Four last year. So I've got a really good understanding of Homestead. I feel like that's maybe one of the only, you know, one, two tracks on the schedule where I might be able to sneak a win past uh, Morton and Nanny and a Leaf. So, yeah, we're just going to go give it everything, try and do what we did last time, qualify in the pole, not spin it on turn one, and just, uh, you know, manage our stuff. I think uh, tonight's race, I was in the middle of a really good lesson on tire wear. I taking care of my stuff really well and i was making great gown great ground on uh the whale and uh charles wembley while they were battling so yeah just uh just gonna go give it everything next week well, well we obviously hate. not the result you wanted but uh unfortunate end there for the 123 but we wish you the uh the best of luck next week at miami yep yep i'm gonna go give it an all thank you guys It was Drew Williams who was kind enough to join us uh, after climbing out of his car, checked and released from the virtual infield care center. Uh, but the only damage done is a massive hit to title hopes and dreams. Well, it also might be a bit of, fi of a financial hit. Hopefully that does not become a recurring thing for his wheelbase. Those oh yeah, hopefully his wheels are the cheapest okay, things to replace. <laughs> I think he just bought that too, like right before the start of the season interesting so hopefully that's uh not something that it repeats itself not only for his aspirations on track but also just in general i mean getting into sim racing is already uh you know a bit of a, a price point itself let alone when you have equipment that's not doing what you need it to do so but back on track here we've just about hit the midway point of this race lap 66 of 133 matt morton leads by half a second over our muhammad alif and on screen here it's the battle for, or now it's the battle a little farther on back. It's the battle for 13th. Glenn Halterman and Edwin Anofre 
a couple of alumni battling it out here into turns three and four. Halterman, one of those playoff drivers, trying to find every point he can get. Edwin and Ofre in the hunt, both him and North Texas in that alumni and alumni school championship. Trying to get every point he can get his hands on here. Try and get a better standings finish there for UNT. Yeah, both of these schools right now in the top five in points. Edwin and Ofre, uh not in the top five individually, but that honor is going to go to Clint Halterman. So if, if you're an Ofre and you're trying to crack into the top five in the Ad Alumni Championship towards the end of the season, every position is going to matter. And this is now going to become a three-way alumni scrap as in comes Thomas Toomey now uh, making his presence known in the mix here for Virginia University. Yeah, he's going to become a part of this battle as well. Same deal as well with Austin DeLong. I mean, all these cars, you kind of see, you could see it on track with that long stretching shot down the back stretch. There's a couple groups of like six, seven cars and then a decent gap and then another group of six, seven cars and there's about three of those on track right now. They've opened it up a little bit here on the front stretch, but you can see it right there. A couple of big chunks of cars, and then you can see where cars are starting to get held up a little bit because there's a gap and then another train of cars. So starting to see where this tire wear might be coming into effect as we jump on board with some of these battles here. Some side-by-side -side action through those corners, and now down the back stretch as well. You know, everyone trying to get those positions that they're looking for. Sky Shrek, Lucas Moody battling it out here for the 11th position. Yeah, Sky Shrek looking to crack back inside the top 10 for the first time this event after uh, I believe she qualified either 10th or 11th. Uh, so a very good run for that 43 Boomer Sooner Esports car out there tonight. Or excuse me, she qualified 12th, so she has now recovered back to where she started tonight's race. And Ben Neller having a really uh, up and down day, it looks like there. So we're jumping on board there with the 79. You can see him back here behind Edwin Onofre, that Ball State car. He's had some work to do. Currently scored him in the 17th position just ahead of Landon Bellicky behind him. But we're reaching that point in this run where those tires are really going to start falling off a cliff. And if you haven't saved anything, you're going to find yourself in a world of trouble. And, you know, I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on the timing tower here. Matt Morton has not really been under pressure from our Muhammad Alif up front, but that gap hasn't entirely ballooned. Alif has kept him within six tenths of a second, but he has not been right on his back bumper the way Morton was to Nanny through the opening stint there. We're going to try and get a confirmation as to what exactly happened uh, with Daniel Nanny there. Um, but as we look at the front of the field, you can see the gap that Morton has built over our Muhammad Alif, Brandon Schulenberger, uh, about a second behind Alif, six tenths from Alif to Morton. So the front of the field uh, is pretty spread out for the time being. You got to go back to about fifth before you start seeing some position, battle for position as you see that mini pack. Coming across the start-finish line now. Uh, there's a couple side-by-side -side battles going on back there for position. Yeah, there is some uh, some good action there from the the 100 of Cummings has a pretty good battle going uh, with Daniel Nanny there for seventh. And then, oh yeah, speaking of which, here goes Nanny to the outside trying to take away that position. The 30 from Ball State, the 100 from Wingate. Couple of playoff drivers, one locked in, one still on the hunt to do so. This and point we, does not matter a ton to the 30, but matter, matters crucially to the 100 and his hunt to try and make his way to the championship race in Kansas in a couple of weeks. Yeah, the best case scenario right now for Daniel Nanny is he wins this race and he takes away a qualifying position from another playoff driver. Uh, worst case scenario, I really don't, I mean, obviously you crash out, but it really doesn't matter because he's already locked into the championship four. Uh, so these next two events are all about Nanny sizing up the field, trying to figure out how they race, the way they race and why they race the way they do. But if you're Jake Cummings, it's the exact opposite. You've got everything to gain at this point. 
and pretty much nothing to lose. Uh, Cummings, I believe, um, was 20 or no, he was one of the drivers that was um, about 12 or 13 points off uh, the transfer position. Or sorry, he, Cummings was eight points behind the transfer line coming into tonight's race. So especially in that battle with Clint Halterman right now, who is the last car in on points, uh, Cummings now has one point. He's clawed one point back out of that deficit to Halterman above him uh, to try and get that last spot in. So Cummings got to be a little bit careful not to ruin his own race, but at the same time, he's going to try to get everything he possibly can, especially when that position above him uh, is a playoff driver. Yeah, and that, that's the part I'm sure that might really weigh on his mind is, you know, he's having a pretty decent run. He's currently scored in the eighth position. But of the seven cars in front of him, six of them active playoff drivers. And of those six, five of them have not locked themselves in to the championship race yet, nor has the 100 of Cummings. And that's one of those situations like we saw last week at Darlington where if you weren't on it 100%, you were going to be in a lot of trouble because all the playoff drivers are just running so well this year. We saw them run really well at Darlington. Now they continue to run really well here today at Nashville Super Speedway. And now, so if you find yourself like Jake Cummings or Clint Halterman just behind him in ninth, I mean, right now you're staring down the, uh, the deficit that is definitely going to be a real battle to overcome, barring, uh, you know, some opportunities on pit road or a caution. Yeah, out of our top 10, only two drivers are not in the playoffs. In our third position, Brandon Schulenberger in that number seven car for Wingate. And in the 10th position, Kelton Quick for Ball State. Our other two playoff drivers not in the top 10, Jason Wallet running 14th right now. He's struggling. Actually just fell down to 15th. So some struggles right now for that Drexel car here in Nashville. And of course, our last playoff driver, Drew Williams, out of the race with that mechanical failure on lap 47 that took him out. Yeah, now as we make our way, lap 81 of this 133-lap race, just north of 50 laps to go. Seems like prime time for us to do a little CIL crank it up action. So let us go now. And big shout out to our sponsors tonight, the familiar strange, the Melody and the Noise 200. As you can see there on below, uh, below of the screen, the bottom of the screen, not below anything, bottom of the screen. Man, I just completely forgot how the English language worked there for a second. English, but, Alex. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough language, man. It really is, but. We are, uh, we're going to do a little CIL Flexware College Cup Series crank it up action here, and we'll let these V8s roar and uh, talk to everyone at home for a minute here while we step aside.
Welcome back, everybody, to the Melody and the Noise 200, presented by The Familiar Strange, celebrating the release of their self-titled debut album, which you can find wherever you find your music and or podcast. As we're working on lap 89, approaching lap 90 of 133, and it's been a scrap out there for all of these positions. Playoff drivers dominating the top 10 at the moment. Matthew Morton out in front of the field. The only other driver to have led a lap this race, Daniel Nanny. Problems on pit road during our only caution of the race on lap 47. Uh, trouble in that pit stall. He dropped pretty much all the way to the back of the field, but has now clawed his way back up to seventh and is looking to gain some more positions. But it looks like for the time being, this race is going the way of Matt Morton and nobody with the potential to challenge him at the time being, at least until we get our second round of pit stops, which should start in about 10 laps or so. Yeah, it's about that point where they came down pit road about 50 laps ago. And from this point, it'd be 40 laps to the end. So if you want to try and split it loosely down the middle, if this stays green the rest of the way, now would be around the time where you start thinking about coming down pit road in the next couple laps. And yes, here see, they come. Uh, yeah, a couple of takers already making their way down pit road here. Shrek, Cummings, I think that Sanchez has come down pit road. I saw Wallet. Yeah, Jason Wallet's down on pit road now. So the drivers are coming. They're coming down pit road uh, to make their final service stop of the evening. Four fresh Goodyear tires to get back out on track and try to secure as many positions as they, as they can. But... If you're Jason Wallet, you want a lot more positions because you've not had a great evening so far. But here's somebody who's had a phenomenal race, Brandon Schulenberger from Wingate University. Here you see Landon Veliki coming down pit road as well. And who is where? Whose pit crew is in their boxers right now? Is that <laughs> that is Andrew Stegi's pit crew? Something tells me that the sanctioning body might not be super happy about the uh, the lack of fire retardancy there. Uh, but that is neither here nor there when it comes to the virtual world, I guess. I guess it's a good thing the 88 is in fine condition right now and not smoking it on fire. And now the Boxer Brigade going to go to work on the 88. <laughs> Boxer Brigade. Yeah, NASCAR is going to have a time with that uh, crew chief for the 88 machine. But, uh, yeah, April Fool's, I guess. <laughs> April Fools, they just didn't bring the fire suits to the track tonight, I guess. Now you, you got Charles Austin DeLong coming, coming down, down as, well. as well to make his stop. Thomas Toomey coming down now, as well as I believe that is, uh, which PCT driver is that? Is that DeLong? Yes. That would be Austin DeLong. I believe Zach Tallman making his way down pit road as well right now. So now the question on everybody's mind is when is Matt Morton going to come down pit road? When are the rest of the leaders going to come in? Uh, you saw the Wingate cars come down. Zach DeWale has yet to come down, as well as Daniel Nanny and Clint Halterman. Uh, in fact, I believe... Oh, here goes there Morton he goes. Right, now. <laughs> right on cue, Matt Morton down pit road. Going to get that car slowed down from 150 down to 45 miles an hour. Zach DeWale is coming down pit road right behind him as well. The triggers have been pulled inside the top five. Here we go. This is going to be the money stop to get to the end. And now looking at who's on pit road, Daniel Nanny will inherit the lead. It would leave only three or four cars still on the uh, the lead lap who have not come down pit road yet. Halterman, Neller, and uh, Andrew Burl, the remaining group there. So Matt Morton getting service on that number one car. We'll have to see where he fits back in the traffic alongside Alif and Schulenberger. Those were the top three cars before the pit cycle. Matt Morton here. You see Cummings go on by. Same deal with Halterman. There is Alif and Schulenberger just behind them. They are up to full speed. Morton going to try and blend in with traffic, but doesn't quite have the speed just yet. A leaf will oh, go oh, on by. And now Schulenberger right behind him as well. Oh, but tried Muhammad to Leaf shoot the uprights. <laughs> Couldn't get the move to stick. Morton threw a huge block coming out of turn four. That number one car is on cold tires. So he's going to be just a little bit slower 
in the corners than the rest of these cars as the rest of this field now going to try and get by Halterman. It's a four-way battle for the lead coming off of pit road. The strategies have all converged together, but it's going to be a matter of who's got the better car later on down the line. Clint Halterman conceding the lead and dropping out of the top three for the time being in turns three and four. So maybe he pitted a lot. Maybe he pitted earlier, a lot earlier, because no, he was very in, slow. I think he's the only car yet to come down pit road besides has, Ben Miller okay. and Andrew that Burl. Explained. So they got their lap back, and they're currently scored fifth, sixth, and seventh. Jake Cummings actually is ahead of all of these guys right now, and he has come down pit road. The 100 will inherit the lead when the 077, 99, and, one, and, uh, and 99 come down pit road as Burl does now. The battle for provisional second place here are Muhammad Alif, Matt Morton. Morton on those slightly fresher tires. Alif trying to defend on that high side. No separation between the two off the corner. Nearly door to door. Now side by side, they go back in the turn three. This is going to be a side by side battle for at least a few laps here. These are two of the these are two of the title favorites, Alif and Morton, side by side, scrapping it out with Brandon Schulenberger just behind them, ready to pick up the scraps just in case anything happens between these two. It's now Morton with the nose. He gets a little bit loose through the center, pushes a leaf up the track. Both of these drivers able to keep it out oh, of each other in the wall. And now they're, da they're banging doors down the back stretch. They, here we go. This is the fight that everybody wanted to see. This is what a spot in the playoff means to these two drivers. And the elbows are out and the gloves are off here with 33 laps to go from Nashville. Ben Neller inherits the lead as Clint Halterman comes down pit road. Neller, the last car who needs to stop still. Then it's Cummings with this great battle behind him. Alif and Morton continue to remain door to door into turn three. The 12 not going anywhere on that outside. The one can't get the run he needs on the inside. And now Neller has come down pit road, which means that Cummings uh, will inherit the lead the next time by. Actually, no, I think Neller might have had a moment because that gap came down about a second coming through turns three and four. As now Morton, Whoa, little switcheroo switch here, looks to the outside. A leaf slams the door in his face. Out of the move, out of the textbook of Matthew Morton, and that shows you just how much is on the line between these two drivers. This is a great battle here, and as they've battled, they still have somehow reeled in the 100 of Jake Cummings. He is the car who will inherit the lead whenever the 79 does bring it down pit road. So this is about to become a four-car battle for the lead. Two Wingate cars, Ball State and Ohio State, all duking it out for what will be the lead in a couple of laps. Now Alif looks to try and get around the 100 on the outside. Cummings trying to hold on here on the inside lane. Morton going to jump to the high side as well. He thinks that outside lane might be a little bit faster, but as they make their way in the turn one, Jake Cummings going to try and hold on to it on the inside line. And Alif is going to take away Whoa. the lead for the time being, but Cummings very slow through turns one and two. He's actually going to block Morton, and that lets Alif get a huge lead relatively down the back straightaway. It's now a three-car battle for the second position, as now Morton is going to be able to get around the 100 contact Whoa. between the two almost as they come out of turn four, and now it leaves the two Wingate cars side by side as Matthew Morton can reset his sights on that number 12 car. Cummings got loose through four, clipped the one a little bit, and the big loser in that exchange was ultimately the seven of Schulenberger, who got pushed up to clip the outside wall. He's gotten around the 100, though, being on those slightly fresher tires. And as Ben Neller makes his way down pit road, you've got R. Muhammad Alif leading by four-tenths of a second over Morton, who's four-tenths of a second over Schulenberger, who's about three-tenths of a second over Jake Cummings. We are coming down to the wire here, and we've got a great battle for the lead. We know Matt Morton's got slightly fresher tires than a Leaf, but how much may have got burned off in that side-by-side -side battle with the 12 that went on for so many laps? And that's what I'm wondering is, you know, uh, Cummings looked really slow there compared to the rest of the leaders, but he's on. he was on relatively older tires. And with Morton and Alif and Schulenberger battling so much between them, how much of their new tire 
did they burn off doing that? Could we see a possible last second resurgence from both of these Wingate cars to maybe have a stab at the win for Jake Cummings? It would mean a spot in the championship four on his second win of the season for Schulenberger. It would mean his first ever college cup series win after a phenomenal season where he's picked up so much momentum. It would mean the world to these Wingate drivers to be able to walk away in victory lane today. But if you're a Leaf and you're Morton, you're two of the title favorites uh, as we've learned this season. A win would lock yourself into the championship four where you don't have to worry about what happens next week at Homestead, barring a potential disastrous race as we've seen a la Drew Williams earlier. A lot of questions remain to be answered here. 25 laps to go from Nashville Super Speedway. A Leaf three car or maybe about four car lengths the difference right now between him and Matt Morton they just got around the lap traffic of Edward Sanchez a moment ago and now there is nothing but clean track in front of the 12 right now Aleve has got two wins this season they were both road course races at the Roval in Montreal this would be his first oval win this season potentially if he's able to hold on but he lost a lot of time out of turn four that time around Morton closed the gap by over a tenth and a half that last circuit. And now he is starting to close in on the back bumper of a leaf here. There could be some fireworks on display as we get to the end of this race. I'm is taking down for both of these drivers to get the win to vault themselves into the championship four at Kansas. The race next week at Homestead separates both of these drivers from a shot at the title unless one of them can win tonight. For our Muhammad Alif, if he can win, that means he has a shot at potentially winning two championships in the CIL this season. For Matt Morton, it would mean a shot at retaining his College Cup Series title. The current reigning champion from Ohio State knocking on the back dump, knocking on the back bumper of that number 12 car. Morton is there. They're going to cross the start finish line, nose to tail. Where does Morton go this time into turn one? He takes the conservative approach and lets Alif run his line. Now Morton shows his nose to the inside. Alif dives to the bottom to block. There's still going to be nose to tail coming out of turn two. Matt Morton sitting in the tire tracks right now of our Muhammad Alif. You can see the onboard cams of both drivers here. Alif on your left, Morton on your right. This is exactly what Morton did at the start of this race to a Leafs teammate, Daniel Nanny. Sat right in his tire tracks until the time was right to make a move after sitting within a tenth of a second for 30 straight laps. He does not have that kind of time this time around, and a Leaf knows that. Morton will have to force the issue here, but he has plenty of time to try and wait on it here. And as they come to the line, it'll be 20 laps to go from Nashville. Our Muhammad Alif trying to lock his way into Kansas, but he has got a mirror full of an OSU Buckeye right behind him. 20 laps too short for uh, Matt Morton, and that's 20 laps too long for Alif. Alif wants this race to be over as quick as possible. Morton wants as much time as he can to set up the move in Alif for Alif, try to get in his head a little bit, maybe force a mistake. But if that's the math, if that's the route that Morton's going, it's not going to work. A leaf, a very level-headed driver. It's not very easy to get in his head to force those mistakes. As now Morton with the better exit out of turn four, he sticks his nose to the inside. They're going to be side by side going into turn one. Who's going to be later on the brakes? Who's got more resources to give in these last 19 laps in this race? They're banging doors. They're side by side. They're trading paint coming out of turn two. A leaf with a bumper ahead. Matt Morton, what is he going to do going into turn three? A little bit less on the brakes. For the number one car, still side by side, but better rotation through the center of the corner for that number 12 car. Still side by side as they complete yet another lap, 18 to go that time by. They are nearly two seconds clear of Brandon Schulenberger. Whoever gets the better of this exchange might go on to win this race. They remain door to door through one and two. Our Muhammad Alif on the outside, Morton of Ohio State on the inside. Morton's got four wins this season. The Leafs got two. 
The Leafs still looking for that first oval victory of the season. Morton, all four of his victories have come when it's only making left turns as we hit 17 laps to go. They continue to be side by side. Neither driver giving an inch. A bit of a wider entrance there for the 12. He's losing a little bit of ground. He's only barely got that nose to the outside of the one. And Morton shuts the door. Contact there between the one and the 12. A Leaf pushing Morton all the way down the back stretch in the three. This is an incredible battle. This is exactly what we wanted to see here at Nashville. This is the kind of fight that it puts on, and it just means so much more when there is a championship spot on the line. Massive championship implications for both of these drivers if they can walk away with the win today. And right now, that advantage is going to go to Matt Morton. We talked about that at the top of the show, how controlling he is. He knows his car. He knows the resources he has to work with. And he saves them up until the end when it really matters. And now Morton pulling away. He's got three-tenths of a second on a leaf. And the leaf just kisses the wall slightly coming out of turn four but still has a better run on Morton. There's about a, a five, about five hundredths of a second chopped off the lead down the front stretch that time by. Yeah, you can tell the 12 now is really starting to push it, just trying to do anything to keep the one with them. It's really just these two cars, Brandon Schulenberger two seconds back, and he's the only car within five seconds of these two battling for the lead. So it looked like Morton clipped the wall just a hair coming off of turn four that time around. And the 12 will once again make up some ground off of turn four. He seems to lose him going through the corners, but he seems to get a better exit off of four, which is at least partially keeping him in contention as they start to make their way up towards lap traffic here. I believe it's the 26 of Edward Sanchez once again. I don't think this is enough lap traffic to really be a problem. Uh, Sanchez, a very smart racer, uh, he's definitely going to step out of the way and let these two guys do their thing. But Morton right now opening up a pretty sizable gap to Ar Muhammad Alif right now. Alif is going to have some serious work to do in these last 13 laps remaining uh, in this race if he wants to take a stab at this lead. Maybe he spent too much of his tire trying to defend against the attacks, the onslaught of attacks from the number one car. Uh, maybe he overheated them just a little bit. Or maybe Morton's going to burn through the rest of his stuff, and maybe Leaf will have a nice late race surge to try and take away the win. They've only got 12 laps to settle this out. The one thing that is worth noting is that Morton did pit a couple laps after the 12 of Leaf. That much we do know is now Morton closes in on the 26. 26 wasn't really sure where he wanted to go on the corner there. Morton's going to go to the inside after a little bit of hesitation there from Sanchez. And the 12 is going to get a run off the corner and now dive to his inside trying to get around him. So a little bit of a... Uh... A little bit of a blockage for both cars. A Leaf able to close in about a tenth of a second, but then that gap will reopen up as they hit one and two. So they'll get around the 26, and the next car uh, that could go a lap down here is the 62 of Landon Veliki. You can see him. He's about the exit of turn four when those two guys hit the entrance of turn three. They will probably reach him before the end of this race, but he might be the last lap car that these two encounter before the end of this race. So if Alif is going to have any semblance of a chance, he's going to have to try and hope that he can use the 62 as a pick as Veliki would fight to stay on the lead lap. Barney's got 10 fingers in the air as a huge mistake for Alif coming out of turn two. 10 laps left in this race, and Alif absolutely pancake clobbered the wall coming out of turn two and that is all but gonna hand this race win to matt morton as that is now a 1.1 second gap and change that a leaf now has to overcome to get to that number one car if he wants to win this race so right now it's looking like it's going the way of matt morton how does he do it matt morton looking like a really strong contender for the win at this point with less than 10 laps to go in tonight's event and I'm looking at this top 10, a couple of playoff drivers in the mix. Daniel Nanny has fought his way back from the issues on pit road to be currently scored in the top five. There's actually a really good battle going on for fourth there. Oh, we've got a few laps here. Charles Wimbley, Daniel Nanny, and Zach DeWale, fourth, fifth, and sixth, all nose to tail right now as they run. 
Battle for the lead may be all but decided, but there's still a lot of racing through the field as we're going to try and take a look at that battle between uh, Wembley, or excuse me, Wembley, Nanny, and DeWale. As there you see it, they're three wide with lap traffic almost coming into turn three, but it is going to be Charles Wembley to the outside of Daniel Nanny. These are three drivers battling for playoff position. Every point here matters. Zach DeWale with no idea where to go. He's got a wall of bumper up in front of him. And the 26 of Edward Sanchez, a pick on the bottom, possibly, for Charles Wembley. They're going to go three wide. Whoa, no, Sanchez, Sanchez throws up the, block. the track. <laughs> accidentally throws the block on Nanny. And I bet Nanny is not happy about that. But he got bailed out by a bad run out of turn two for that 37 car. Three wide once again coming out of turn four. It's Guilford College and Charles Wembley with the better run. He's going to retain that advantage and still Zach DeWale with nowhere to go in front of him. Whoa, big slide up the track from the 30. He tried to go for the slide job. Wembley to the inside. DeWale to the inside of him. Three, three wide, wide on the back stretch. Three playoff drivers into turn three. All of these points so critical at this stage in the race. And here comes Andrew Stagey trying to get involved in the mix. DeWale might get around on the inside. Nanny's in the wall. He clips the wall, in the wall, nearly takes 37 with him. And now the 519 has the nose ahead of both of these guys with five laps to go. This is going to be a barnstormer of a finish between all of these drivers. Let's try and maybe go side by side with our leader and these drivers for the time being. But Zach DeWale makes up both of those positions in just those two corners. Nanny and uh, and and Wembley fighting so hard that they let the whale by, and they're still side-by-side -side going at it as they've now let Stagey into the mix. So that's a huge playoff point bonus for Zach DeWale as he's able to make up both of those positions. Four laps to go across the line that time by Whoa, contact, contact between the 37. He's loose coming off a of turn two. The 88's in the wall. And now all three of those drivers battling for position. It has been a physical affair here between the 30 and 37 in these closing couple laps. Zach DeWale was able to capitalize on that battle by getting around both of them. Andrew Stagey trying to do the same, but trying to not get wrecked in the process, which is easier said than done right now with three laps to go. As now Wembley looking all over the back bumper of Nanny, trying to find the way around. He'll look to the high side here off of two, try and get some of that run down the back stretch, and maybe try and send it into turn three. We'll see what approach he takes right now, right behind the 30, now drifting half a lane higher, getting some fresh air on the nose of that car. It is a good battle going here between these guys in the top five. A lot of playoff points on the line, but only two laps to go here from Nashville Super Speedway. Matt Morton, three seconds clear of everybody. He'll probably win it, but a ton of points still up for grabs here in fourth through sixth. Zach DeWale is also pretty much checked out in that fourth position, so the main battle is going to be between these three guys in the middle of your screen, that purple ball state machine of Daniel Nanny, the red and white machine, Guilford College machine of Charles Wembley, the 88 of ball state from for Andrew Stagey, white flag as they cross the line that time by. Who's going to take these positions away? Who's going to be better on the playoff points as they go into turn one for the final time? It's 30, 37, 88, nose to tail, basically, through these corners as Matt Morton is going to come out of turn four and win the Melody in the Noise 200 presented by the familiar Strange, but it's Charles Wembley down to the bottom of Daniel Nanny. He tries to make the slide job work. He's got the inside line. It's a drag Whoa. race to the start finish line. Who's going to take it? I think it was Daniel Nanny to take away that fifth position. My goodness, what a race. Eight thousandths of a second, the gap between Nanny and Charles Wembley there. A wow. great scrap for the final position and the top five. Matt Morton will win it. Oh, and contact Ooh. there between the 100 and the 30. Not sure think, what was going on there, but. I think that was a congratulations gone wrong. You saw the 30 get up to give that congratulatory tap to 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 Nanny, but it's all gonna it's, it's what a finish. Where do we even start? Right here, Matt Morton, the winner of tonight's Melody and the Noise 200 at Nashville. He has officially locked himself into the championship four at Homestead. He will be able to defend his title. Was there ever any doubt that Morton could do it? He loves these 
strategy races. He loves being able to save his tires and he thrives at these sorts of tracks where it's all about management and that Ohio State car is going to burn it down for the fifth time this season. He's won almost half the races. It's been a dominant season so far for Ohio State University. And right now, that car is only one win away from winning the title. Man, what a what a race. You know, we had a great battle for the lead there in the closing laps. And then just as that ended, we had an insane battle inside the top five with all of our playoff drivers. It, you know, Nashville Super Speedway really turned up the heat in the closing laps there and brought us a lot of action in a very short amount of time, but well worth it indeed. And a big victory for the number one of Matt Morton. Our Muhammad Alif will finish second tonight. And Brandon Schulenberger for Wingate will smack it on the podium there. The number seven, a non-playoff driver with a podium finish here tonight. A really, really solid run there for the seventh. And the alumni winner this evening uh, is going to be the 519 of Zach DeWale. Um, so we will have interviews with all of them uh, in just a second once they start getting out of the car here. Looks like a couple of them are starting to get out and kind of take a quick drink of water, get settled in. We'll have an opportunity to talk to them in just a moment. I'll concede a half a point to you for picking the for picking the class winner. Uh, I'll give so, myself a half point. So I'm two and, two and, a, half. and a half out of the past. Three. Two and a half. Uh, it, I'll give you that. It one. was it was a <laughs> win. It just wasn't the race win. <laughs> Well, speaking but, of yeah. race wins, let's go ahead and talk to tonight's winner, Matt Morton from Ohio State University. Was there ever any doubt you are the tonight's winner of the Melody in the Noise 200 presented by the Familiar Strange? Congratulations. You will officially be able to retain to have a shot at retaining your College Cup Series title. How does it feel? Feels pretty good. Um, Nashville was a pretty good track for me. I had it circled on the calendar. Uh, especially in the playoffs, I knew it was going to be a pretty good shot for me to win my way in, and luckily that's what we were able to do tonight. Yeah, you had a uh, you had the work for it there late. A good battle between you and the twelve. There's been several of them so far this season, and another uh, chapter was written between you and a leaf there and battling for the lead late. What was that battle like on track in the closing laps? Uh, yeah, and that last stint right there, um, from my perspective, it was a little frustrating just because of how hard it was to pass and how dominant clean air can be. Um, but at a certain point, we were just side by side, and I was just going to let him run on my door a little bit, um, run the higher side, abuse his right front a little bit more. Um, and then one lap, I just decided to go for it in turn one. And ho luckily, we were able to gain the position and get the lead uh, to finish it out there. Um, but it's always fun battling a Leaf. I know he's super good, um, especially on the roadside. And how he's able to translate it to ovals is pretty impressive. So it's always fun battling him. Um, and glad we were able to have uh, another fun one tonight. Well, Matt, it seems to be that these races where tire conservation and resource uh, management are at the forefront of the strategy. These sorts of races you do so well at. What's your secret? How do you how do you do it so well? Uh, it's just really understanding uh, the limit of the car. Um, obviously, driving to the limit is different than the limit of your resources. So just really being able to understand, you know, how am I slipping the tire and how I can really avoid that. Um, and also just driving it easy in the corner, not abusing your right front um that's a big one especially in nashville in turns one you see drivers go way up the track and way deep in the corner and that's just really hurts your right front um and also i think understanding how to deal with dirty air is a big one um i was able to learn a couple lessons from my guys over at nexus um and really just understanding how to combat dirty air and where to place your car, where to run on the track is really beneficial. So just really all those tips combined is, I think, what helps me a lot at these types of tracks. Well, Matt, you are officially the second driver to lock himself into the championship four. 
Like we said, you're going to be able to go to Kansas and have a shot at retaining your title. Uh, do you think you can do it? I uh, hope so. Um, had a pretty good run at Kansas, I think, last season and spit on pit road for the last run of the race and kind of took myself out of contention. But I think Kansas is going to play a lot of a lot more similar to this style of track. I know people love to run the wall there, and I in I racing the wall is not your friend. Uh, when it comes to tires, especially in the cup car. Um, so I think learning some lessons tonight and from races past where resources are valuable, I think are going to translate over really well to Kansas. And hopefully I can uh, get the back-to-back championship. Well, congratulations on your W tonight, Matthew. Uh, you know the drill. Anybody you'd like to thank or shout out while we've got you here on the show? Shout out you guys behind the booth, everybody behind the scenes. Um, awesome to be a part of a league like this, representing our universities. Uh, shout out to my friends and family supporting me in what I do. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it tonight. Well, congratulations again, Matt, and we'll see you at Kansas. Thank you guys. Go Bucks. That was tonight's winner from Ohio State University, Matthew Morton, possibly the championship favorite. He has officially locked himself into Kansas in just two weeks' time. That he has. That he has. A big win for him. And, uh, you know, we'll, we now know half the picture for who we will see racing for a championship uh, at Kansas in two weeks' time. Let's go ahead and talk to our runner-up finisher tonight, from Ball State University. Our Muhammad Alif had a phenomenal battle with Matt Morton there in the latter stages of the race, ultimately brought it home second. Uh, congratulations on another very, very strong finish. Uh, you definitely have put a gap between yourself and some more of the playoff drivers behind. Uh, what do you think it would have taken for you to bring that car home into victory lane tonight? Uh, I have a few ideas, I think probably how I could have uh, managed it a bit better. But, I mean, I was just trying to to, to run my line. Um, my line was a bit different to, to Matthew's, uh, but I think he did a very good job. I was losing out, I think, three and four, probably the main um, main part of the track that I was losing out to him. So, yeah, uh, hopefully this should secure us. Not, I, I don't think he's going to lock us in, but, you know, make us, uh, you know, help us you know, uh, going to the, the 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 final four. So, yeah, just learning. You know, racing against uh, the best drivers. You know, Matthew, Daniel. You know, all of them. So, yeah, good result, P2. Um, uh, we keep we keep uh, we keep rising. Yeah, you really opened up the gap to a lot of your uh, your playoff competitors here, and it should make uh, the work you need to do at uh, Homestead Miami next week. Uh, relatively easy compared to some of the paths that these drivers will need to take to lock themselves in. Uh, are you going to be looking to, I mean, I know it's a dumb question to ask if you want to win next week at Homestead, obviously the goal is to go out there and win the race, but how, how much stock do you put in going out there and winning that race versus how much stock do you put into just going out there, making sure you get the finish you need to lock yourself in the Kansas? Yeah, probably the priority is going to be just trying to, get ourselves locked into the final four um i mean what two seasons or a, a year ago we we got locked into the final four but i couldn't make the race because i had to travel but hopefully this time we can lock ourselves in give us a, a good chance a good shot at uh taking that that championship title um you know one race at a time to be honest so that that's currently my uh my 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 heading right now so Well, Alif, uh, looking towards next week at Homestead, we know you had a good run uh, a couple seasons ago. Unfortunately, uh, I believe it was last season when you missed the championship race uh, due to some uh, other, um, I guess, other commitments is the best yep. way to put it. Um, do you feel like that's going to give you a bit of a disadvantage going into next week's race that you don't have that on-track experience with these drivers? Uh, or is that just motivation for you to keep to keep um, keep practicing? I don't think it's a disadvantage just because iRacing is a completely different game from what it was last year. So 
we have different lanes, you know, heating up, cooling down, all these different different uh, changes that iRacing have done, which is really nice. So, yeah, I mean, we have one week to to try to sort out my pace, you know, try to try to bring myself um, to match the leaders or be faster than them. So that's the that's the ideal, you know, to to get ourselves locked in, you know, and then. Uh, and then go all in um, on uh, at the championship round. Well, congratulations again on another phenomenal result. Uh, easily one of the title favorites here in the field as we look towards the latter couple of races in the season. But you know the you know the drill. While we've got you here on the show, anybody you'd like to thank or shout out? Yeah, my oval team. Um, we got Ben, Andrew, Lucas. Uh, Kelton, who's also here. Um, big shout out to them for all the hard work. Um, and we got my road team as well, Kale um, and Bradley, especially as as well as our um, um, esports directors, assistant directors, um, Dan and BK, our Dean Dean Turner, my family back in Singapore, and uh, all my uh, sponsors, Motorsport Singapore, Next Level Racing, and um, yeah, Ball State Esports. Well, congrats again, Alif, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. See you guys. That was our runner-up finisher tonight, our Muhammad Alif. Uh, it feels like for the second or third time this season, about 10, 15 laps short of the win. Um, but you heard him always focusing on the next race, always uh, willing to rebound from a tough loss like that. And that's, that's the making of a champion right there. Yeah, for sure. He's got the the right mindset, I think, going into it, and you know he's going to put in the work to be ready for it. I like his odds at making it to Kansas with the points gain that he's gotten over the past two weeks. And once you get into that final four, it's anybody's bet. You you don't luck your way into that position. You're there because you're talented and you have what it takes to win. And I think if he makes it to that final four, he has just as much of a chance as anybody. Let's go ahead and talk to our third place finisher tonight from Wingate University, Brandon Schulenberger. Round of applause for another phenomenal result. You, we, we said at the top of the show, something, something snapped halfway through this season and you figured something out on this car and you've had a phenomenal string of results. Uh, in the past two races, you have been the top finishing non-playoff driver inside the, inside the top 10 last week at Darlington and on the podium this week. Um, what, where, where did this come from respectfully? <laughs> oh man, no, I, you know, each, I feel like, each, I think I started in season seven and it just feels like each season I kind of just slowly got better and got better. And then coming into season 10, I was like, man, I need to put some practice in and really take a leap. And as the season went on, we just continued to get better and better and i mean even looking after this race it's like dang if i just would have made the playoffs who knows what would have happened but like i said the second half of the season we were hitting and then we got to vegas and i screwed my own race up and i i kind of blame that race for missing the playoffs because we were running that top six or seven and then ended up putting ourselves on the wall and finished 18th or something you know just take those even five points and win the playoffs and then Phoenix, obviously that didn't go the way we wanted. And then Bristol, we did what we could with the damage we had, but it just wasn't enough at the end. But coming into the night, man, I didn't know what to expect because I actually just got my new wheel and pedals put on and I had not done a lot of practice with it. And I was like, dude, I don't know how this is going to go. I practiced for like 30, 40 minutes, an hour before the session opened. And once we got to the end of practice and I had started laying some of the fastest practice times i was like whoa i was like we might actually have something here tonight and then qualified p4 and i was like and then normally the long run is what bites me and when we kind of stayed consistent me jake and Alif on that first run were just under a blanket the entire run i was like i was like man we can really put a good finish up here today so after that caution i think we fell to like p6 drove it back up to p3 and, you know, I was kind of just maintaining. I wasn't really worried about a leaf or Morton, especially Morton was just, he was so good with the tire saving on the long runs. So there wasn't catching him. I was like, well, maybe I can climb back to a leaf. 
I wanted to undercut a leaf, maybe jump him, but he pitted one lap after me, and it just wasn't enough. We all three came out together, but I mean, even I, I wasn't really worried about Morton. My mentality was kind of just hoping a leaf was going to burn his tires up, and maybe we'll have a shot at P2. And those last ten laps, he really started to follow me quickly. There just wasn't enough laps to, you know, get after him. But we will definitely take this first podium. Um, that's not on a super speedway. That's definitely a lot of confidence, and I just really favor these mile and a halfs, to be honest. So um, I'm definitely excited for these last two races, you know, to kind of see what we can do, especially with the new wheel and pedals as well. Yeah, that was going to be my question for you, Brandon, is, you know, it seems like you found something here the past couple of weeks on these mile and a halfs that have worked, and we end the season with two more mile and a halfs. Uh, what do you think your odds are for the next couple of weeks? If you've got podium running pace here at uh, at Nashville, what what do you expect here for Homestead and then Kansas? Well, I think Homestead is my best track ever since I've kind of really started running these next gen. So I'll definitely have some higher expectations for next week. Kansas, I'm not really sure about, but I think regardless, if we can kind of run with this speed with minimum practice and minimum usage of this new equipment you know there's there's no telling what these next two weeks could hold you know i'm not really worried that i'm not in the playoffs you know i think from here on out it's kind of just building confidence you know when we come back in the summer and even the fall see what we could do well jake that's a huge uh or excuse me brandon sorry wrong uh wing gate driver <laughs> <laughs> that's really awkward <laughs> Brandon, big boost of momentum for you, like you said, going into the uh, into the the uh, closing couple of races here in this season. Um, you mentioned just getting your brand new equipment installed. Uh, another driver in the field having some equipment issues, but it looks like the new equipment treated you pretty well. How did that help you out there? Man, that was. Before this, I was on a base G920 and those base Logitech pedals, which obviously don't do a whole lot for you. So to go to the Logitech Pro Wheel and the Pro Pedals, that was that was a huge jump that I'm still for sure trying to get used to. Um, I think the wheel is really more different than anything in my opinion because with the G920, it's all gear driven. And as you're going through the turns, it's all about you know feeling the gears. But this, there ain't, there ain't no gears, so it's definitely a Definitely a big adjustment that I think just the more practice and the more laps and the more practice we can do, just the better off we're going to be. Well, hopefully it serves you well in the future. Better equipment, better driver is what they always say. But congratulations on a great result tonight. Uh, anybody you'd like to thank or shout out while we've got you here in the booth? Uh, definitely shout out to my girlfriend. She tunes into a lot of these races, so I'm definitely grateful for her support, you know, as I do this. And even to my dad, he's, he'll always tune in sometimes and, you know, definitely good support from both of them. I appreciate it. Well, congratulations again on another great result tonight, Brandon, and, uh, hopefully we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. I hope so too. It's always great to see another driver uh, here in the ranks of the Flexware College Cup Series figure it out all of a sudden, and then they just become a beast, a force at the front of the field, challenging for wins. And it seems like uh, Schulenberger has only got last couple steps to go before he's really challenging for race wins. Yeah, I mean, he's found a lot of speed this year. That Wingate program as a whole has been wicked fast this year. And uh, I have now, but week by week, would be less and less surprised if before the end of the year we see him pick up his first CIL victory. Oh, I for one would love to see it. I know, I know I'm supposed to be impartial, but you can't not root for the underdog driver. Absolutely. I could not agree more with you. And, uh, not necessarily a uh, an underdog driver per se, but our last interviewee of the night is uh, someone who's still looking for his first victory of the season, but we'll pick up the alumni class victory here tonight. It is the 519 of Zach DeWale St. Clair College. P4 tonight in uh, what was a pretty solid run, including a, a pretty big scrap there with a few other playoff drivers in the closing laps. Yeah, absolutely. It was a really, really tight race with uh with Charles and uh Andrew uh and um 
<clears throat> excuse me, and uh, Mr. Nanny there at the end. Uh, super tight race, a lot of fun. Uh, glad we could have a, a big long green flag run at the end to uh, to finish it off. Well, Zach, momentum on your side. Uh, you got the alumni class win tonight. You picked up a ton of playoff positions exactly when you needed it the most. Uh, that's going to do a pretty solid favor for you in the case of possibly pointing your way into the championship four. Uh, what's going to be your strategy next week at Homestead to try and make it into the final four? It's it's so hard to say that I'm just going to try and point in because I want I want the win. I feel like it's been it's been kind of just hanging in the balance for so long. It's should be coming. I feel I feel like it should be coming. I just got to go and do it. Um, but at the same time, I got to be smart about it. I can't. Uh, taking any risks just to throw it all away so i'm gonna try and win the race because i feel like that's the only way i can be sure of it and just avoid the stress but uh, uh just try and have a clean race and be there at the end i guess yeah and you know it comes down to a point here where you got a pretty decent bit of points you probably gained a bit of ground on some of your playoff competitors as well uh based off of where they were running in the points so it's really just going to be a who runs the best at Homestead. How comfortable do you feel running at Miami? And what do you think your odds are for, uh, for doing well in that race? I feel pretty good about Miami. It's one of my favorite tracks uh, in the sim. It's nice to be able to, to run bottom, run the top. It's uh, with the tire update that they did a little while ago, it makes it a lot easier there. The lane can kind of move around a bit like we saw at Bristol. Um, so hopefully we can see a bit of that and uh, see the track kind of evolve and move around. I think that's when I'm at my best. Uh, so just going to hope for uh, hope for some green flag runs because I feel like I can save the tires pretty well there and just uh, hope I get to rip the fence a bit at the end and uh, make something happen, hopefully. <laughs> well, we will see how that goes. I have no doubt, and we're all looking forward to it. While we've got you in the booth here, Zach, anyone you'd like to thank or shout out before we let you go on your way? Yeah, certainly. Trent and Chloe, as always. Uh, Emily, Riley, Jordan for always coming and watching the races. And uh, all the OWR guys, for sure. Uh, really fun race. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we were able to keep it green up until the end. That was a lot of fun. It certainly was, and I'm glad you had a good time there as well. But uh, congrats on the alumni win, and we hope to see you again up here real soon. Thanks, sir. And that was Zach Dewell, our alumni winner here tonight. And that is going to conclude our round of post-race interviews. And uh, feels like a prime time for us to take a look at what is the overall final standing from tonight's race. Go ahead and dig right into that. I think we caught producer Christian sleeping maybe a little bit there. <laughs> well, it's to, in his defense, that's entirely on me. We've been out of sync all night. I was probably going to have a closing <laughs> remark or two, but I said, ah, let's just get right into the results. Let's the right driver summed it. it up the best. All right, your winner tonight from Ohio State University, Matthew Morton, the second driver to lock himself into the championship four alongside Daniel Nanny. Half the field is set for Kansas to make a run at the championship. Second place goes to R. Muhammad Alif. From Ball State University, P3, we talked to Brandon Schulenberger from Wingate. Zach DeWale, your alumni class winner tonight from St. Clair College, brings it home fourth. Fifth goes to Daniel Nanny, a phenomenal recovery drive after a mistake on Pitt Road. Number 37, Charles Wembley from Guilford College will finish sixth tonight. The 88, Andrew Stagey from Ball State University, seventh. Eighth goes to the 100 machine of Jake Cummings from Wingate. Ninth goes to Clint Halterman from UNC Charlotte. And sneaking into the top 10 at the end, Thomas Toomey from UVA. Yeah, and 11th there, you've got Kelton Quick from Ball State. And his teammate, Lucas Moody, will finish 13th. They'll sandwich in Edward Onofre from North Texas, who finished 12th. Playoff driver, Jason Wallet. Brings it home 14th for Drexel, and we'll probably lose some more ground in that playoff hunt there with that finish tonight. And Austin DeLong, the last car on the lead lap tonight, finishing 15th for the Penn College of Technology. Landon Veliki, 16th tonight for Auburn University, just ahead of Sky Shrek from the University of Oklahoma. Andrew Burrell from Clemson, 
will finish just ahead of Ben Neller from Ball State and Zach Tallman from the Ben College of Technology. And our, and our last two cars in the field tonight, Edward Sanchez from Baruch College, who will bring it home 21st, and Drew Williams, the only car who did not finish tonight's race, that heavy contact with the turn two wall, will finish in 22nd and put himself in a very tough hole going into Miami next week. Yeah, indeed, he's in a tough hole uh, to dig himself out of. I think we called it. It's looking like a must-win scenario for Williams going into Miami. But be sure to keep an eye on our CIL socials, uh, Instagram at CIL underscore racing for those updates as they come out over the course of the week on our playoff drivers. But, man, what a race. Nashville put on another show and just based off of what our drivers are saying in uh, the server after the race, they had a blast. And I, I'm already ready to come back. What a race, man. Yeah, it was stellar stuff. A uh, ton of fun. A lot of action at the end there. We had a great battle for the lead. And then when that wrapped up, a great battle inside the top five that was separated by eight thousandths of a second coming down to the line. So overall... Nashville put on a pretty entertaining show, if I do say so myself. And uh, now that only leaves us with two more races left in the Flexware College Cup Series this season before we crown the Season 10 champion. We're two races away from having our 10th champion. That's insane, just how far this league has come in 10 seasons. It's a, it's a special season. It's Season 10 for us. Uh, here in the Flexware Cup Series, and I've, I'll argue and say that it has been the most exciting season we've ever had. We've had five different winners over the course of the season. Uh, obviously, Matthew Morton, the dominant force out there, but he hasn't gone unchallenged. Uh, we've seen plenty of drivers win this season. We've seen plenty of drivers able to finish the job, but Matthew Morton, man, you can't can't bet against that number one car. He's just so good. Uh, as we have next week's race at Homestead and then the championship race at Kansas. Um, obviously, you at, you folks at home, you make the call who's going to win the title, but we still have two more championship four spots to dish out next week. Yeah, so April 8th is when we are going to Homestead, Miami, one week from today. Race starts at 9 p.m., but the Ignition Zone pre-race show starts at 8.30 p.m., and that's when our live coverage will begin. It will be the Miami 200, the last race of this round of the playoffs to decide the last two playoff drivers who will move on to fight for a championship. Will one of them win it and lock their way in, or will two of them have to point their way in? That is the question that will be answered one week's time when they go to the high banks of Homestead. And if you're like me and you can't wait for more CIL action, Formula C is going Dutch this week as we head to the circuit Zandvoort for the first time in Formula C history. That's right. They made the country from a nat from the F1 national anthem into a real thing with a track Whoa. that's been anticipated by all of our drivers for months. Uh, Ball State University have already clinched the student constructors championship, but the title fight now lies in the hands of two of their drivers, Armada Leaf and Kale Davidson, and it's all down to how well they can finish this incredibly dominant season. On-track action from Zandvoort will start at 8.45 Eastern Sharp here on CIL Vision. And the action continues on Thursday night as the Collegiate Prototype Challenge gears up for our next event from Road America. This is one of the longest tracks on the calendar this season, and with all of its twists, turns, elevation, and high-speed straightaways, it's going to be an extremely entertaining race. Jordan Johnson, though, seems to be losing some momentum in the championship fight as our Muhammad Alif has closed in significantly over the past few weeks. So we may have ourselves a title fight in the prototype challenge after all. So see if Alif can get any closer to finishing an unprecedented comeback with action starting this Thursday night at 845 live here on CIL Vision. Alif could be going for the three-peat across all three series. That's something that he almost did back in season seven. It was last spring. He all, I think he came about 20 feet short of winning all three titles uh, in the CIL, which was would be an unprecedented feat that nobody has ever done before. So he's got a good shot. At pretty much completely locked out the title in FC. He's mounting the comeback in the prototype challenge, and he certainly is not out of it here in the Cup Series 
as well. But two weeks left of action here in the CIL. It's all going to come down to championship week. And I think I speak on behalf of all of us when I say we're extremely excited for it. Uh, we can't wait. But I believe that is going to do it for all of us tonight. So on behalf of myself, co-commentator Alex, producer Christian, and all of us here at the CIL, we'd like to thank you in, thank you for tuning in to tonight's Melody in the Noise 200 presented by The Familiar Strange. And until next time, stay fast. Racing isn't easy, but experiencing it is. iRacing puts you in the driver's seat with the industry's leading sim racing game. Drive on laser scan replicas of the greatest racing circuits from around the world. Go head to head against other drivers chosen by skill based matchmaking to ensure competitive racing at every level. Compete across all your favorite series. In officially licensed cars, engineered to deliver the most accurate driving experience possible. Join a race or host your own with players from across the globe. Race against the computer or in a league with friends. Feel the thrill behind the wheel. Visit iRacing.com.